Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Social media was created to connect people, but it's having some unexpected consequences for our mental health, especially in children and adolescents. With 45% of children reporting being online constantly and another 44% reporting frequent social media checks a day, there are some things that both parents and children should know about how to use social media safely. New research is showing that social media use, when left unchecked, can increase rates of depression and anxiety in youth and creates a fear of missing out and an opportunity for online harassment. Well, today I'm excited to have two experts on the topic to share their knowledge with us. Bailey Parnell was named one of Canada's 100 Most Powerful Women. She has a TED Talk on mental health and social media use with over 2 million views, as well as a master's degree on that very topic. She'll share her five steps to safe social media use in the second part of our show. Our first guest, though, is Dr. Meg Seymour. Dr. Seymour received her PhD in psychology from the University of Michigan and is a senior fellow with the National Center for Health Research in the United States. Her work focuses on the intersection between physical and mental health. She's the author of their recent literature review on social media use and mental health in young people. She joined me from her office in Washington, D.C. to tell us more. Hi, Meg. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, this is such an important topic for people, I think, especially in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have a small community, people know each other. You have done some research into the impact of social media on adolescents and young adults' mental health, and you work for the National Center of Health Research. Um, What does that center do, and where are you located? So we're located in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. And what we do is we conduct and analyze and communicate about scientific research in a way with the goal to ensure that consumers have safe medical products on the market and that consumers have information about which medical treatments or medical products are the best for them. And that includes even mental health as well as physical health. Right, because they're so interlinked these days. And that sort of lends itself to your background. You have a background in psychology, correct? That is correct. So I got my PhD in social psychology at the University of Michigan. So you were one of the primary authors of this article. And people may not understand how scientific articles work, but this is called a literature review. So it's actually almost a better quality of research because you looked at the whole field. Um, Can you tell me a bit about the paper that you wrote? Yes. So... For starters, I just want to you know say with scientific research, you know not everyone has access to the scientific literature or the time or the scientific training to understand it. So the goal for the paper was to take the big question of what is the media on mental health, and so we went into the literature and tried to gather the information and get the truth, make heads or tails of it, and then write it up in a way that anyone can understand it. So the main question of the article is what is the mental health effect of using social media, especially for young adults or for adolescents. And and before we get into what the impact is, it's probably important to understand, like, how widespread is the use of social media by these uh, populations, which is adolescents and, and young adults? Well, it's most people in those age groups. And even not just do most people use these apps and websites, but also they use them for a large period of time per day. So one statistic is that about 45% of adolescents say that they are online almost constantly, and another 44% say that they're checking their social media several times a day. So not only is it most people in that demographic, but it's also a large amount of time spent on those applications and on those websites. Wow. And, and, you know, the platforms are always changing. I know that there's different platforms that are used by different age groups, but what are the most commonly used platforms for young people these days? Well, the ones that we have data about is that Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter are very commonly used. And then more recently, we've seen that TikTok is becoming more popular, but unfortunately, I haven't seen any data on its prevalence yet. I think because it's so new that scientists just haven't had time to catch up and study its use specifically. 
Exactly. I mean, when you think about a scientific publication, it usually takes a year or longer, at least, to get something written, reviewed and published. So I can see why that could be a little bit behind. And technology changes so quickly. Is there a different usage of these different platforms, depending on what age you are? Yes, a little bit. So we see that, you know, adolescents, if we're thinking of those as 13 to 17 year olds, and then young adults, if we see that as about 18 to around 24 years old, we say that young adults do use social media a bit more than adolescents do. So, for example, I think about what I use for social media. I would use Facebook. I would use Instagram. I might use Twitter. Um, but, you know, probably won't be putting up a TikTok video or even using Snapchat that much. Do the younger populations migrate to some of those apps, you think, more than the early apps that came out? So it seems like across the board in what the data we have that the older crowd is just using all of these apps at a higher rate. Uh, Instagram is pretty similar between the two groups, but overall we just social media use among the older people. And I mean, maybe that has something to do with the fact that younger people might have monitoring from parents and fewer ones might not have access to it in the way that a young adult would have access. That's right. When you think about a smartphone, they're usually several hundred dollars minimum. So I could see why that could be challenging to get access for a younger person. But as soon as you get a, a job, I'm sure one of the first things people are buying are phones. Is there a difference between males and females when it comes to the use of social media? Yes. So we actually see that females use social media more often, like more apps, and use them for longer time periods per day. And not only is there a difference where females are using more social media for longer, but we also see that the way that people react to them on social media is different. So there are studies where females, when they post something on social media, will receive more hurtful or rude comments than males posting. So they're using it more and they're also having a higher amount of negative experiences on it. Wow. And I mean, and you think you said earlier that people are, you know, sometimes constantly on. Is there like an hour figure for how long people are on social media a day for these groups? Uh, and a surprising amount, actually, some research that measures how much time people are spending. And we see that about 40 percent of adolescent girls are spending hours per day. About 20 percent of boys are spending three or more hours per day. And then other people if the time adds up over time, so not just long periods of checking every 10 minutes when you have time, it adds up and we see people spending hours and hours per day. And you, you said something earlier that was really interesting, and that was that, you know, when people post something, they might not just be getting that positive feedback, they may also be getting some negative feedback. What are some of the real challenges or risks that people are facing? So, for example... You know, that would be one thing like bullying, but what about self-image and things like that? Well, certainly. So cyberbullying is a big problem, as you're just touching on. And it's not a negative effect on people when they're being explicitly negative things about themselves. But we can also see that social media can have a negative effect on how you, on self-image, even regardless of people saying anything negative to you. So there's research where when people are looking at others' bodies or pictures of attractive people on social media, it makes them engage in what's called body surveillance to your own self, and you're looking for flaws in the way that you appear. You don't even need people to be mean to you on social media to have a negative experience with social media. How has the sort of influencer side of things changed what people consider normal? Oh, I love this question. So in psychology, there's something that we call upward social comparisons where you look at someone that you think is better than you and you start comparing yourself to them and finding how you don't measure up to that person. And so influencer culture is really driving a relationship with these upward social comparisons. Humans do those all the time anyways. It's a natural process. But then if you're going on social media for hours a day, like we were saying, and you're coming across people who are presenting only the good parts of their life, you're going to compare yourself to them and think, well, Maybe they don't have bad parts of their life. You're not seeing the bad parts. They're only showing you the good parts of their life. And so you can start thinking that everyone else has an easier life or a better life or they're prettier. They have better vacations. And you start feeling negative about yourself. And we see that there's data that these upward social comparisons that people are engaging in on social media lead them to feel more depressed and less satisfied with their own lives. Wow. Wow. And, and the other thing about it is that most people don't actually look like that. A lot of these apps use face filters and they do photoshopping for their feed items that are going to be there permanently. Do people acknowledge that that's 
what's occurring or do people just assume that's what people look like? Is that, is that part of the problem? It is definitely a problem. So people seem to not understand the severity or the calmness of these filters. And anecdotally, plastic surgeons have been reporting for the last few years that they're seeing an increase in patients coming to them wanting to look more like filtered photographs of themselves. So people, it's it's the norm to you. And so people start seeing what they look like in the filter, comparing it to what they look like in the mirror, and having a conflict and starting to feel bad about their own image. We're here with Dr. Meg Seymour from the National Center for Health Research in Washington, D.C. She's talking about the impact that social media is having on the mental health of young people. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Meg Seymour from the National Center for Health Research in Washington, D.C. She's talking about the impact that social media is having on mental health in young people. The other thing that uh, that came out of the paper when I was reading through it, there was two things that I thought were really interesting. The first thing is there's a disruption in sleep because kids are always monitoring them, uh, the activity on social media and are expected to be there 24-7. The other thing is FOMO, so fear of missing out. How have these two factors sort of permeated their way into the new social fabric? The reason people are staying up later on social media is because in this age, this digital age, there's this expect you have to be accessible at all times. Message someone, you expect them to respond back immediately, right? And so people are staying up later, being accessible, not wanting to miss out on a message because you want to maintain those social connections. You don't want the person to be frustrated at you and you don't want to exactly fear of missing out. You don't want to feel like you're missing out on social connections that are happening while you're sleeping. So you're getting less sleep, which we know is bad for mental health. So poor is related to more depression, for example. Well, so if a parent sees that their child is is starting to be affected by social media, what should they do and how do they approach the topic with their child? I think there's a few things that you can do. One is that Start by being a safe place for your kids so they know if there's something going on with social media like cyberbullying, they know that you're a safe person in order to talk to. Another thing is to have conversations with them about the nature of social media and how people are presenting themselves on it. So earlier you were mentioning you know, fifth ration, filtering, how people are only showing the part of your life. So have conversations with your children about how this is going on, that social media isn't necessarily reflecting reality that when they're using it, they have fewer of these negative upward social comparisons or judgments on themselves when they're using it. Mm-hmm. And, and bullying used to be pretty obvious too. You'd be in the playground, somebody would push you down, you get in a fight or something like that. People could see it. But now those bullies can follow people 24-7 at home. How should parents approach cyberbullying if they feel like their child might be the victim of it? Well, that's something where schools need to be involved because so most children have reported being cyberbullied. Uh, three quarters of students have at some point in their life been cyberbullied. And like you're saying, exactly, this is happening outside of the view of parents, outside the view of teachers, and it needs to be systemically addressed. Not only do schools need to address this with students, but parents need to be a safe person they can talk, the child can talk to when that's happening. And unplugging at least for maybe my generation, being closer to middle age, has been shown to actually be beneficial for people. So there was a study that came out that said that people that shut down their Facebook account for a month reported lower depression and anxiety and increase in, and an increase in life satisfaction and happiness. Why would this happen? You're right. There's research that when people completely remove social media from life, you see an increase in life satisfaction. And other research, they just take it down to 10 minutes per day, not even needing to entirely cut it. Minutes, feel a lot happier than the people who have an open-ended hours a day. And it comes back to what we were talking about earlier. There's data about people are making fewer upward social comparisons when they're using less social media. So they're exposing themselves to less things to make them feel bad about themselves than they are otherwise. That makes perfect sense to me, and uh, it allows you to focus a little bit more inward on this stuff. Have they ever done research like this with children where parents have taken the social media channels away from from the kids, and and what's happened if they have done those studies? That's an interesting question. I've seen a study about what happens when you remove social media from someone who already has it, 
What I will say that psychologists, social psychologists who study this in particular, I've seen them give advice where they say, don't let your child get a social media account until they're a little bit older, because it is easier to wait till they're old enough to maybe engage in it. And it is to have them have it when they're younger and then try to remove it. Right. And they're growing up with it. So it's almost the most, it's the norm for, you know, some older people, it's not the norm to have social media, but if a child grew up with it and it's been, you know, part of their, their social interactions, uh, I could see how that'd be tough to remove. The, the one thing I was wondering about as well is that anybody can access anybody when it comes to a social media type thing. They can send a friend request. You can be friends right away and you can start a conversation. Is there, has there been a sh- an increase in predatory behavior towards children in social media? There is. So like how we were talking about how cyberbullying can occur outside of the views of parents, predatory behavior can occur outside of parents' views as well. So there are various texting apps where people will find kids, they might connect with them on something like Instagram, and they'll start messaging with them. And so predators can definitely contact children away from the eyes of their parents. Mm. If kids are spending this much time on social media, how is it affecting their health? Because they're not outside playing spotlight or building a fort so in general we just we see that screen time in general is causing a a relationship with less exercise so not just social media like playing video games with your friends online is also related to that so we do see a decrease in kids these days are exercising less than kids a generation before them Mm mm-hmm Yeah, and their health risks go up with that. Now, we've talked a lot about the negative side of social media. Are there any positive aspects for young kids uh, when it comes to using social media? Absolutely. So I don't want to come across as that I'm saying that social media is entirely bad. We know there are these risks. We know that there can be some negative mental health effects, but there can also be positive effects. So, for example, social media lets you connect with anyone that you know at basically any time. Adolescents in particular their relationships are one of the most important things for their development. So they have access to their peers that can be good for them, as well as a to connect who might otherwise feel alone in the world. So if you, for example, if you have a particular chronic illness, you might be able to find a forum or a Facebook group for people who have that same thing. And you can share experiences with people instead of feeling isolated in your town, feeling like the only person with those experiences. Right. And especially with the pandemic, uh, there's been lockdowns all over the place and people feeling more isolated than ever. Social media can help bring people together and, and share some of that positivity around connection. So I could see the value in that. But say I'm a, I'm a parent and I want to manage my child's social media activity. Do you have some tips on what they can do to be able to do it the right way? Yes. So one thing that I think is important is earlier we were talking about how the lack of sleep can lead to depression. One tip that you can do is pick a time at night where you turn off social media or you turn your phone so you can just go ahead and go to bed. You can also pick one day a week where you completely turn off all social media. You might just avoid it on a certain day of the week. Another thing is to be mindful of the ways that you're using it. So there's there's something called active use of social media and passive use of social media. But active use is when you're posting things with your talking, sending messages to other people, and passive use is when you are scrolling through the phone, kind of just looking at other people's feeds and not actually responding to them. And we see that people who engage in passive use have a lot more of these negative health effects, but people who are engaging in active use and actively talking to other people, it's not as negative. That makes sense. And, and you know what, when you talk about the, the comparisons, maybe it's a good idea to, if you follow certain celebrities or different people, to make sure you choose positive role models as opposed to ones that may cause a negative self-image too. Any, any advice on that? Well, occasionally you'll see influencers who are to who break the norm from other influencers where they will talk about different difficult things in their lives. A celebrity will talk about having a certain negative experience, a miscarriage or a chronic illness. And it's helpful to see when people are posting those realistic things on social media. So you have a sense that it isn't all everyone having a perfect life besides you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we've all seen those pictures where it shows people at a party taking pictures of themselves having fun at a party, uh, but they're actually on their phone the whole time. So yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's some good advice for them. You know, this was a comprehensive paper that you wrote. Uh, you read all the literature out there. Was there anything else that stood out or surprised you in the findings? So one thing that's a little bit shocking is that we see this relationship in which health for teen girls is 
becoming worse over time. So an increase in the amount of depression that they're experiencing over time as a group, more suicide attempts by that age group. And this is coinciding with the increase in use of social media over time. So that's a question that leads people to ask, okay, is social media causing mental, are people with mental health problems, is that increasing for some other reason and they're happening to use social media? And so the research does seem to suggest that it's happening in both directions, where people who maybe are more depressed or more anxious can use social media more, but the ways that people are using social media are leading to these increases in depression and these increases in anxiety. And we see that teen girls are using the media a lot more, so we're seeing that they're increasing in their depression a lot more. Right. And the social pressures around women and men are very different. Uh, so it's, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? It sounds like they both came at the same time. We've, we're wrapping up here, but are there any final thoughts you'd leave our listeners with? Sure. So one thing, I don't want to come across as if I'm being negative on social media. It's here to stay at this point. So the question is not, should we be using social media, but how should we be using social media? How can we use it in the most healthy way? And so I think things like being mindful of your social comparisons, being mindful of the amount of time that you're spending it per day, maybe even being more realistic yourself post so that when other people are looking at your account, they're not making those social comparisons about looking at you and uh, judging themselves. Mm -hmm. So being mindful on how can we use social media in a healthy manner. I appreciate you taking the time and sharing mm -hmm. sharing all of this information with me. It's such a great resource, and I appreciate you calling in all the way from Washington, D.C. Thanks again, Meg, for taking the time. Thank you for having me. That was Dr. Meg Seymour from the National Center for Health Research in Washington, D.C. When we come back, we're joined by Bailey Parnell, whose TED Talk on the impact of social media on mental health has had over 2 million views and forged a business which helps individuals use social media safely. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our next guest is Bailey Parnell. Bailey is the founder and CEO of Skills Camp, a soft skills training company, and was named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. Bailey's a TEDx speaker with over 2 million views and an award-winning digital marketer. Her work and expertise have been featured in Forbes magazine, CBC, Fox, Flair magazine, and more. She did her master's in communications and culture at Ryerson University with research looking into social media's impact on mental health. The results of this were presented at the World Youth Forum in Egypt and turned into her signature, Five Steps Towards Safe Social. Hey, Bailey, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here, Mike. So you are an expert in how social media is impacting our mental health. And you gave a TED Talk. And during that TED Talk, you spoke about a vacation you took after working for four years straight where you decided to completely unplug can you tell us about that trip, but also what are the phantom vibrations you were feeling from a phone that wasn't there? What happened on that trip was that I realized that social media and mobile technology was having an impact on me, whether I was making it conscious or not. What made it conscious was not having it there. But had I not gone on a trip where I decided like going dark you know, it would have just continued unconsciously or mindlessly. And I never would have really thought, you know, intentionally about the kind of impact I want it to have on my life. Mm -hmm. So yeah, phantom vibration syndrome was part of that for a lot of people. And um, for your listeners who don't know what that is, that's when you think your phone went off and you almost feel it go off yeah. and uh, you check and it didn't. Mm -hmm. And there's also research to suggest at least as, as long as even four years ago that we might even be rewiring the brain now to think of an itch as a vibration. Shocking. Uh, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely some evolutions going on. I mean, people's postures are changing uh, and, you know, and, and, and just our overall behavior and the way that we, we feel. And that's one of the things you really, really worked on was that you were able to identify some very clear risks. But before we get to those risks, one of the stats that blew me away was about the usage in Canada. What, mm -hmm. What's the percentage of people that are using these social channels or platforms? Yeah, so four years ago, I had a stat in that TED Talk that was um, about 70%, even over our voting turnout. <laughs> Nowadays, it's like 
94% of 18 to 24 year olds use some kind of social media. Mm -hmm. And that includes things like YouTube and Reddit and kind of not the big three there four that we always talk about, but those are social networks as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost everybody that mm -hmm. has some, you know, some connection to some social network. And just before I, I mentioned when I left Ryerson just before that, so this was probably early 2018, I finished up, uh, Again, professional research at Ryerson that was with pretty good sample size, well over a thousand students. Mm -hmm. And we asked them questions like, how much do you use? Why? What platforms do you like most and least? And um, they self-reported, the vast majority of students, like over, over 60, 70%, self-reported spending at least four to six hours a day Dang. on social media. Wow, that's a so, lot. A lot. And now, you know, as you, as you would know, if you've, re if you research anything that's stigmatized, like how much reality TV do you watch in a day, then we know that people typically under report the truth. No, you can't put that in a, you know, in a, in a journal piece. You, you we kind of know that if you said two hours is probably three. Right. And yeah, so, exactly. It's still four hours. Yeah. If they're self-reporting four to six hours, it's probably like eight to nine. And right. I don't do anything for that long. No, you can get a lot done in that period of time. That is literally half of a work day. So this has to have risks for us. What are the risks that people face? They're spending this enormous amount of time on these platforms. Yes, and I'm very glad that you worded it that way because back uh, in the TED Talk, I feel like I could have a whole other TED Talk since that came out in 2017, but... Now, uh, where my research has brought me in the last few years has been that social media use and using and being on there is absolutely a risky behavior. And in psychology, we judge a risky behavior like sex or drugs or alcohol as something simply where when you participate, you expose yourself to potential harm. Mm -hmm. And we know for sure now, this is old news, that there is potential harm on social media, whether that be you know, seeing traumatic imagery, harassment, comparing yourself often to other people's highlight reels, stress, frustration, like the list goes on and on. We know that there's potential risks of using. So I'm, I'm very glad that you're calling it that yeah. because it is a risky behavior and it should be treated as such in the same conversations as, as drugs and alcohol, if, if you ask me. And so some of those risks I kind of just mentioned, some of them would be, um, you, you know, feeling lonely because especially even right now in, in the pandemic that you're seeing everybody's more connected than ever, but no one's connecting. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of one of those quotes out there that we're supposed to be more connected than ever, but we're also showing higher levels of loneliness than we've ever shown even before the pandemic. Oh, I can't even imagine what it's looking like now. Yep. Loneliness then would become a potential risk of what you consume on social media, um, anxiety, depression, as a result of things like comparing yourself more frequently on social media. FOMO, the fear of missing out, is, the, is a potential risk because it's also one of been shown to be the greatest indicator of addiction. So the, the degree to which you feel FOMO on social media, so the degree to which you feel like, oh my gosh, I need to check, mm -hmm. will correlate with the degree to which you might be addicted. Not totally surprising, those two, that correlation. But addiction then becomes also a potential risk of using. And we can talk about social media addiction. Right now, it's probably most interesting because it's both physiological in terms of what's being released in the brain, as well as physical and habitual. Well, that's interesting because you compare it to alcohol or drugs or other risk behaviors like even driving, okay? And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have to be a certain age to participate in these things, but now there's children. So I got social media as a adult, so mm -hmm. I'm a different generation. I just made it by it. But there's kids that are growing up, and that is foundational to them growing up. Mm -hmm. What's some of the work that's been shown? Like, How does it impact them as they develop? Well, you know what, Mike, it's not great right now. And, but I don't think that it has to be that way. And that's actually the crux of all of my work, including the TED talk is that in, in my own study with my own participants, what emerged is that it doesn't have to be, I suppose the question for young people today, has so much empathy because they're at a very normal, normal days of life, especially around 11 to 25 and especially puberty, you know, like 11 to 19 sort of. 
such a normal phase of life where you go outside the home to compare yourself as a means of understanding your identity. We call this peer-to-peer comparison, and it usually happens around puberty in terms of social psychological development. This was happening long before social media. So you're in that phase of life, again, constructing your identity, comparing yourself at a really elevated rate, except now you're doing it with this profile that's attached to you only. It doesn't turn off. And then it's quantified for everybody to see, which is sort of falsely convincing these young people Mm -hmm. that it's an objective comparison, but it's not. And then let's just say you're that young person going through that normal phase of life. There's no off switch. There's no commercial to remind you to take a break. And maybe something does happen and you're being harassed in your DMs and you want to go to the supports that might traditionally help you with this stuff, like guidance counselors or teachers or parents. And you say, I'm being harassed in my DMs. And some of them might say, well, what's a DM? Yeah, right, right. So they're at a weird phase of history, not just young people, like young people in general, but young people today, where largely parents and educators and the people that would normally help you with this kind of thing did not grow up with social media themselves. They were actually conditioned differently. Yeah, and it's difficult to understand uh, the the social currency uh, mm-hmm. of 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 really you know we we give worth to. And the other thing about that, the people that we're giving the most attention to are people we're comparing ourselves to, and they happen to be maybe the fittest people or the best looking people or the most stylish or the most wealthy or whatever, which then makes mm-hmm. our life seem drab. Um, like, so true. how is the influencer culture? Um, shifting you know what is considered normal because when i was a kid there was a cool kid in school we compared it to that person but now we can compare ourselves to every cool kid you're so right and uh at the beginning of the ted talk one of the things i mentioned was the the sort of presence of the highlight reel and Mm -hmm. what is the highlight reel and kind of just like in sports the highlight reel is a collection of our best and brightest moments and we are putting out those times where we look the best and including those fitness fitness models and travel bloggers and I've talked to them and I've worked with them and they are also my friends and I know what goes on behind the scenes in terms of media media production was literally my undergrad I know what goes on behind the scenes all of this effort to make something look effortless Mm -hmm. and so Trust me, when when we are comparing ourselves to these photos that we see that are edited and manipulated, you are quite quite literally comparing yourself to something unreal. Right. And that is wild if you think about it, because not only does comparison, it's been shown in terms of social comparison theory in the in the history of the research about social comparison theory that elevated comparison in general can lead to potential decline in mental health, but particularly elevated upward comparison. So if yes. you have upward comparison, kind of like you're looking up at someone neutral, kind of like you make a judgment there, you deem them the same and then downward, you kind of look down on them for some reason. Upward would be again, that you're seeing everybody else as better than you for some reason. And then you think about a fitness model or, you know, whatever it might be of the day on Instagram And you compare yourself to their best version to yourself. And so you end up in this spiral if you don't have the tools to understand, you know, what's going on here and then how how you can improve that comparison. We're here with Bailey Parnell, the CEO of Skills Camp and TEDx speaker. She's sharing her work in the impact of social media on our mental health. When we come back, she'll share how we can be safe when using social. Welcome back. We're here with Bailey Parnell, whose research into the mental health impacts of social media was shared at the World Youth Forum in Egypt and created the basis for her signature, Five Steps Towards Safe Social. Let's check it out. One of your businesses is about <laughs> using, uh, doing safe social. What, is, mm-hmm. what does that mean? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. Um, (laughs) Safe social, you know, kind of as like a link to the last question you asked was that even though I just mentioned upward comparison, often having sort of an an adverse effect on someone's health and mental health in particular, there is also a whole host of people in my own research. Again, I feel myself included in this these days and a whole section of my thesis about social media having a positive impact on people's mental health. Mm -hmm. And... With the And so what's kind of funny about that is practicing safe social is, is this idea that if we're telling young people that you need to be on social media to connect, to brand yourself, personal branding, to find jobs, to do all this stuff, 
then abstinence without consequence is not as much of an option for young people today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the question then becomes, how do you practice safe social? Right. And so <laughs> practicing safe social is all of the things that you can do, the strategies. I have my five steps towards safe social, but everyone might be doing it in some way already that help you get the benefits of social media use with less of those risks. Mm -hmm. So for example, that upward comparison I mentioned, there's a group of, in my research that saw that did upward comparison, but it actually had a positive impact on their mental health. Mm -hmm. So why it was because like me, I see travel bloggers and I see fitness models and style bloggers. And I really like it. Actually, I don't think I'm naturally stylish. So I need the ideas and I think (laughs) that they're fun. And I like to see where I didn't know I wanted to go in the world. So me and a couple of my participants, they would see this and they would think, you know, I'm going to add this to my vision board and I'm going there and it would be motivating and inspiring for them, even though it was the same comparison. Mm -hmm. Now here's the really interesting thing, but I'm biased, (laughs) but (laughs) The really interesting thing was that not only did two different feeds affect two different people differently, but the same feed would affect the same person differently at different times of the day, depending on how they felt about themselves offline at the time of use. Hmm. So it kind of almost exactly sounded like this, which is this stuff is not in the TED talk. Yeah. So it almost sounded like this. Um, you know, if I went to the gym that day and I feel good, then I see a fitness blogger and I think hashtag goals. But if I did it and I feel dusty, I see them and think I hate my life. Huh. Which is really interesting because that means that the most important thing is not actually what you're consuming. It's how you feel at the time of consumption. Mm-hmm. That makes perfect sense. I was just going to say, like, the example I was thinking of immediately was like, I ate something crummy. You know what I mean? And now, so now I'm looking yeah. at all these people like eating healthy smoothies and everything else. And you're just like, oh, I'm so bad. I could see mm-hmm. how that could affect people. So a lot of it comes down to the behavior that we have around the things that we're watching. So yeah. if you use it for yeah. motivation to inspire you to continue to do those positive behaviors, yes. But maybe if you're somebody who's a little bit insecure or struggling with that, maybe you shouldn't be exposing yourself to something that you're having trouble doing. That's exactly right. If you know yourself that you're feeling down about something right now, you need to redesign your feed to support the stuff that will make you feel good, make you learn, make make you lean into all those benefits. And that's going to look a little different for everybody. Hmm. What were some of the other tips that you have for people? Because that's a great tip. Right. Yes. So I do have my five steps towards safe social. And the first step is um, building awareness and understanding. So even listening to this right now, everybody here is starting on step one. They're, they're learning a little bit about what's happening out there, the potential risks of using, and maybe some things that you can do about it for yourself, your kids, whatever. That's step one. Step two is after you've thought a little bit about how is this affecting me and what's going on, it's moderating consumption. So doing those things we just mentioned, changing who I follow, uh, redesigning my feed, uh, you know, not using my phone for you know, more than an hour a day, whatever it is for you, it would be actually taking those steps, moderating consumption. And, and there's a lot of recommendations for free on our website, savesocialmedia.co. Then you move to step three, which is building the offline soft skills. If you really want to have a lasting impact here, based on what I just told you about the the true reason people were feeling down was because of their lack of soft skills or confidence in the moment or self-awareness about what was going to stress them out. And if they could have figured out what, what actually stresses them out, they could have maybe designed a feed that fed them more of the benefits. Mm. For example, if they were building resilience in themselves, they were, they would be able to, to bounce back from anything they saw. And so it, social media would have less of an impact on you, less of a negative impact. Mm-hmm. Step four is modeling good behavior or leading by example, because we right now are defining what this is going to look like in 20 years. And parents sometimes don't want to hear it, but not only are we showing young people what is okay to post and what's okay to say, but we're also modeling our relationship with our technology. So, you know, are you mad at kids because their head is in their phone all dinner, but you've been on your email all dinner and they don't know the difference. You're st- are you upset that kids watch a concert through their phone these days, but have you been documenting their entire life on social media, right. on Facebook? And maybe is it at least possible that this would behavior was in part learned or my, 
least favorite is when people are complaining and spreading hate online all the time, but then also complaining that social media is a toxic place. And what you don't see in the TED Talk is that since then, I actually added step five, which is holding the responsible parties accountable. And that was because, well... I give the first four steps. Everybody says, you know, this is really, this seems really important. Who's responsible? And so that's why that had to come in. So like any other risky behavior, it is a multi-pronged approach that's going to require a number of parties who are active. And what I didn't say in that talk is that Twitter and other companies, the social media companies themselves, as well as our governments are two very active parties in people's relationship with social media. Or or in the case of our government, we usually non-active parties Mm -hmm. because they're not doing very much right now, to be honest. So so Twitter, I think these days, um, you, you, You're right. When we talk about this dark side, we still are talking about the dark side of people. I I do believe we are still talking about what somebody said or someone was a thought was okay to do with an egg instead of, you know, in behind their anonymous selves. Mm -hmm. That's still people. And that's going to have to be a societal shift. But then in the meantime, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, you do have some responsibility if you're going to be making this much money off of keeping people addicted, because that is the business model, right? To keep people there. Uh, you're right. And you've seen that more recently where certain people have been banned off of platforms. Certain mm-hmm. apps are not allowed on app stores, which is mm-hmm. a positive step in the right direction. But this brings me to an interesting point. There's a reason why social media is free to all people. And that's because mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. said that we are the product. And, you know, yes. So, so explain what that means for anybody who's listening, because, you know, it never really occurs to you. You use this product for four hours a day, but it doesn't cost you a penny. Why is that? Well, you, you hit it right on the head, Mike, which is that I actually came from social marketing. So I know the economy of attention. Like I made money on the economy of attention and it's essentially the idea in marketing or in all tech these days is that if it's free, you're the product. So what that means is that something like Facebook, that's free. The way that Facebook makes over 90% of its income is through advertising dollars. So what they do is they don't sell the platform. They go to a Budweiser, let's just say, and they sell your eyeballs. They sell your attention. They say this many people is going to look at you. And so that means then when you think about social currency, which is these likes, the comments, the shares, even further now, it's like the extra three seconds you spent on an ad, that private message, you forwarded a photo and you sent it in a private message to your friend. These all become recorded transactions attributing value. That's the economy of attention. That also makes then you the product. So if it's free, you're the one being sold. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes perfect sense. So I'm listening to this now. I'm a little bit freaked out because of what I'm hearing. Okay. Um, if I'm listening, what are some action? Have you talked about, you know, uh, being more cognizant of your feed and designing it, which I've never heard designing your feed. I think that's brilliant. Obviously that's what you do for a living, but I love that concept. Um, what are some action names we can do like today if we want to start making some changes? So I'm definitely, I ended with the very long-term high level things that we can do, like making this a a point of importance with our our politicians, as you've seen in the last few weeks, regulating big data and big tech, but the sort of everyday things we can do, how can we ourselves practice safe social is start by, well, go to safesocialmedia.co and follow the steps there. That's going to be the easiest way. (laughs) And there's a lot of free assessments there. Like, am I addicted to social media? And um, am I a good safe social role model? Those are all there. And then you might think, okay, well, you know, am, do I feel that I'm on social media too much in a day? And there's very possible that based on how many listeners you have, there are people that think, I don't think I am. And actually I have a very good time on social media. And if you've completed step one, you understand about it and you think I'm good, that is okay too. I'm not, I don't want you to create problems where there's not, but I do want you to understand that there's a lot of people that are not good right now. And so if you are doing good, maybe you become an ambassador of this message and you help people understand that, um, If you want to use less, did you even know that you can set time limits? You know, the 16 year olds know this very well these days, but sometimes I still go into parent rooms or educator rooms and they're like, really? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So it might be seem like an obvious thing to some of us, but to many others, maybe you didn't know that could, that you could eliminate certain words from being allowed on your photos, your comments in Instagram. So if there's certain words, you know, you never want to see the B word, the C word, you can actually completely eliminate those. If you're someone who's public, maybe being harassed, 
maybe you decide, you know, I don't want to wake up to my phone anymore and you get a real alarm clock. <laughs> but, yeah. the, but the thing is, I, you have to ask yourself because I, my phone is my alarm clock and I like to read the news when I mm-hmm. wake up in the morning mm-hmm. and I have at least reflected, you know, does this positively affect my life? And I've deduced that that has, mm-hmm. there's other things that haven't. Sometimes I realize like, okay, if I want to do some deep thought work or focus work in my business, I need to kind of turn the phone over or put it away Mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind. That would be practicing safe social. Mm -hmm. So again, practicing safe social or any of the strategies you, you make to get more of the benefits of social media and mitigating those risks like frustration and stuff. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I know how busy you are, but I really appreciate (laughs) your expertise and I know everybody listening does as well. So thank you. Oh, no problem. I really want to get this message out there. So I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks to both Dr. Seymour and Bailey Parnell for joining us today. These two leading experts agree that social media is likely here to stay. That means we need to learn how to use it safely. It seems to be especially relevant for youth who are using these platforms. So if you're a young person or a parent of an adolescent, Take our guest's advice and audit your behavior to see if there's any unhealthy habits or addictions developing. There's lots of benefits we can get from these tools if we use them properly. So get inspired to improve your health by following the right people. Look up pictures of your dream destination for the day we can travel again and stay connected with your loved ones. That's our show this week. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.